want to grab your Bibles and be making your way to the book of Numbers, and specifically chapter 14. And just in case you need a little help, open up to the front of your Bibles, you'll find the book of Genesis, and now we're just going to start moving to the right. So move a little further, you're going to hit Exodus, then you'll hit Leviticus, and then boom, you'll find yourself in the book of Numbers. That's where I believe God has laid out an assignment for us from His Word tonight. My son Graham... He lights up every time we come into this place. He starts smiling, his eyes brighten, and he tries his best to say church, but typically it comes out more like chich, chich. But he knows where we're at when we come into this place, and in his mind, it's amazing because in his mind, this place is synonymous with excitement. This place is synonymous with fun. This place is synonymous with getting to see people who look and live and act differently. And I pray that as he gets older, he never loses that outlook on gathering for worship. And I pray that we would have that same excitement about our Savior as well throughout the entirety of our lives. That when we gather together in the house of the Lord, we would do so with excitement and we would do so with joy. That this would be a place in our minds that's synonymous with having a good time and with encountering the presence of God. Our Lord is living and active. Would you agree? So let our worship be living and active. Let our teaching be living and active. And then as we go from this place tonight, let our application be living and active as well. That being said, like my son, I'm excited to get to the Word and show you what God gave me. A little bit of context for you. As we move into this passage tonight, God has liberated His people from 400 years of Egyptian bondage. And He has, through Moses, been leading the people through the wilderness towards the Promised Land. They've arrived at the edge of the territory that God had promised to give them, and 12 spies had been sent in to scout out the land and see what all it contained. The spies had returned, and 10 out of the 12 had said, Bad news. This ain't happening. There's no way that we're going into that place. Yes, it's gorgeous. Yes, it is prime real estate, but that place is crawling with giants. And there's no way we can enter into this land that God said He was going to give to us. We hate to tell you, but it looks like we're finished. It looks like this is the end of the road for us. It's been a good run. God's done some amazing things. Things that we never expected He could do. Things that we thought were impossible for Him to do. But it looks like we're coming to the end of the road right here. And what follows in Numbers chapter 14 is the response of the people to the report of the spies. So God's word says, starting in verse 1, Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And then they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord." And do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. When the Lord led me to this passage, the first time that I read through it, there was one thing in particular that stood out to me, and it's found in verse 3 when the people said, would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And the Spirit grabbed my heart and said, right there, I want you to see that thought. So I believe He wants us to look into this thought together, the thought of, would it not be better? Would it not be better? Nudge someone beside you and tell them to think about it. Think about it a little bit. 
Would it not be better? I want you to think about that a little bit as we work through this message together tonight. Because I've come to realize more and more lately just how much our choices are filtered through and guided by what we believe is better. A lot of you in this room, some of you currently, you have chose schooling based on what you thought was a better option than any of the other options that were made available to you. When we travel, you will choose a destination and then hopefully you will choose lodging based on what you think is better. So when we consider a family vacation, we think, well, what's going to be the best thing for us? What are we going to enjoy the most? And where are we going to stay at that's going to benefit us the most in having that experience? The same thing goes with food. You sit down at the restaurant and they hand you the menu. All those different choices that you've got on there. In that moment, what seems better than everything else is what you go with. It's the same way with the cars we drive. Some of you are Chevy people. Some of you are like Ford until I die. Some of you Toyota, some of you Dodge, some of you Lexus, some of you Land Rover, those of you that are really blessed. (laughs) Some of us would like to choose what's better, we just can't. We're the same way with what we drink. Whether you're Mountain Dew or Dr. Pepper, Coke or Pepsi, one or the other, don't none of y'all drink water because you enjoy it. You do it just because it's the better choice, right? Everybody else is having a Coke, everybody else is having sweet tea, and there's that one person at the table that's going to start the trend of everybody else has got to get water because that's a better option for us. Don't tell me that you drink water because you enjoy it. Why do y'all think they come up with those Mio's and Kool-Aid pouches? Because we feel like we have to drink water because it's the better option, but we can't really stand to drink it. It's the same way with daycare, parents. You're going to have the best for your kids, aren't you? So when it comes to finding somebody to take care of them, you're going to choose the better option or what you think is the better option for your daycare. Same way with the relationships. We choose what we feel like benefits us the most. Even in relationships, the same thing with clothes. You put on clothes or you buy clothes based on what you think you look the best in. Some of you could do a little better job of picking things out. (laughs) But for the most part, we're going to put on what we think we look... Best in the same way with shoes. We buy shoes because we like the style of them. We like the looks of them. The same way with sports. We choose to play one sport over the other because we enjoy it the most. Our lives are full of different choices that more times than not, we're going to go with what we believe to be the better option. And so here stand the Israelites right on the edge of promise, but there's a problem. You ever been on the edge of promise and encountered a problem? They're standing right on the edge of promise, but there's a problem. It doesn't seem possible. And then the thought shows up, would it not be better to just go back to Egypt? And I really want you to search this with me because when it comes to the paths and purposes of God, whether we realize it or not, we're entertaining and assessing the same thought. So I think it's important that we peek at the reasoning these people used, and we'll call it for the sake of fun, their Israelite intuition, so to speak. What guided them into making these kind of thoughts and what steered these thoughts? When they asked that question, would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? So I want to look at some particular things that were driving forces behind why I think they asked that question. The first of which they thought, would it not be better to turn back? So when I see the Israelite people standing on the edge of promise and they're looking into the land that God's given them, but they see that it's full of giants and it seems like it's going to be unconquerable. When they say, would it not be better to go back? What I really hear is, would it not be better to turn back around? Go back and look in verse 2 with me. It says, all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we have died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back. So after listening to the report, the murmuring starts and then it begins to spread. The only thing that spreads faster than an actual virus is a bunch of murmuring. Believing that certain death was what awaited them, the people cry out, we could have died in Egypt. We could have died in the wilderness. Good job, Moses. Good job, Aaron. Appreciate you bringing us out. Hey, by the way, thank you, God. Thank you for bringing us out of bondage so we could come out here and just die. Appreciate it. Good job all the way around the leadership circle. Thank you very much. In the wake of that, they hatched the idea, let's just turn back. Let's retreat. After all, that'd be better than remaining here and dying, wouldn't it? Seems like a better option to me. 
Seems like a better option to them, and it seems ridiculous to us, right? Because we know the rest of the story. And we know the story in its entirety. So that's why it kind of seems ridiculous that the people would say this at this point because we know what they witnessed. We know that they experienced amazing things at the hand of God up to this point. I mean, he liberated them from bondage. He sent the plagues that convinced Pharaoh and the Egyptians to let them loose on their way to escape be part of the Red Sea so that they could pass through. On top of that, each and every morning, they had bread from heaven. In the afternoon, they had quail from heaven. And then when they got thirsty, God provided water from rocks. Now, I don't know how many of y'all have went outside lately and smashed rocks that were laying on the ground, but typically water doesn't come out of that. And it seems ridiculous because we know all the things that God had done for them up until this point. That's why we don't really like studying the Israelites, I think. It's because they remind us too much of us. So often, we're moving right along in life and then we run into something difficult or challenging. It may even seem impossible. It may even seem unattainable. And we get intimidated. And what do we do? Well, we decide maybe it would be better to just turn back. This calling that God placed upon my life, do y'all know how many times I've wanted to turn back? I know the feeling. We know that God's got a plan. We know that God's got a purpose. We know that God has laid out a path and we're doing our best to follow Him on that and then a challenge shows up and when it seems like we can't cross it, the thought comes up, would it not be better to just turn back? I fully believe there are some people here that were at one time following the the path God was leading you down and something showed up that challenged you, whether it be a financial struggle, whether it be a discouraging word from a family member, whether it be friends that deserted you in the midst of what you were pursuing, or whether it be a physical condition that you haven't had to deal with at any other time in your life, something showed up that challenged you, and then forgetting about all the ways God has provided for you in the past, you decided in that moment it's time to turn back. But there's something else that that question brings to mind that I think fueled it for the Israelites as they got in. It's not just would it not be better to turn back, but would it not be better to choose comfort? Go back and look at verse 4. It says, they said to one another, let us choose a leader and let us go back to Egypt. Now, it wasn't just the decision to turn back that I want you to notice. I need you to notice the destination that they were choosing to go back to as well. Egypt was the place of their bondage. Egypt was the place of their oppression. Egypt was the place of their pain and their heartache. So why in the world would they think it better to go back to that place. I'll tell you why. Because it was comfortable to them. And I didn't say it was convenient. I said it was comfortable. And there's a difference. Comfortable is relaxing. Comfortable feels nice. Comfortable is non-stress related. Convenient just makes life easy. And as strange as it may sound, from my life experience and, and from watching the life experiences of others, more times than not, people will trade convenience for comfort. And I'll give you a couple of reasons why. Number one, because comfort is familiar. The promised land was flowing with milk and honey. Egypt wasn't flowing, but it was familiar. They knew their way around. They knew the demands that were required of them. They knew what to expect on a daily basis. There were no surprises. Why? Because it was all laid out for them. The Egyptians gave them their work schedule. They told them when they would eat. They told them when they would drink. They told them when they would sleep. That was familiar for them. When people live in bondage for 400 years, freedom's a hard thing to learn. And I found, too, that in the process, we're okay with hard when it's expected. And so that's why more times than not, people will choose comfort over convenience because even though they know where they're at is hard, even though they know where they're at is difficult, even though they know where they're at may be full of pain, they're familiar with it and it's expected and it's comfortable. And we would much rather stay in a hard comfort than move into an easier life that's unfamiliar. There's another reason why I think comfort sucked them in. It's not because it's just familiar, but because comfort is safe. Comfort provides a sense of security. Egypt felt safe for them, as strange as that may sound. 
they were protected and provided for while they were there. So should an enemy were to attack Egypt, Egypt would defend its own. Should the people get hungry at the end of the workday, well, the Egyptians would give them food, no matter how little it may be, even though God had already done these things for them as well. God's protection and God's provision wasn't absent from their life either. It was just done so in a harder environment, so they thought. And they went back to that and they wanted to cheat because they thought that was safe. For, for them, it seemed better to go back because it was comfortable. And how many times do we decide that it's better to choose comfort? Once again, I fully believe that a lot of us here in our individual lives, God is or has called you into something new. But you won't leave that job, you won't leave this city, you won't leave this country, these friends, or this family, or that lifestyle because it's comfortable to you. One of our greatest obstacles when following Jesus isn't where we're going. It's where we've been. That's why Paul says, I forget what's behind. And I strain forward. That's why we have such a hard time with grace and forgiveness, right? Because we know who we've been. We have a hard time believing who we are. And so for the Israelites, it's a comfort thing. Would it not be better to choose comfort than to face what seems to be utter annihilation? And then when it boils down to it, the last factor that went into this thought that they had, I believe, was would it not be better to take control? After the people voiced their protests and drew out their plans, Caleb and Joshua tried to stop them. Go back and look in verse 10. It says, in all the congregation, after Caleb and Joshua tried to persuade them otherwise, all the congregation said to stone them with stones. These people had decided it was better for them to take control now. And the best way to do that was to just stone the people who were saying otherwise. Well, I don't know whether we realize it or not, but cancel culture has been around for a lot longer than we think. This is the climax of what's better, isn't it? Is it not? Nothing's better than me having control. I have this real issue with riding in cars with people because I'm not in control. So given the opportunity, I'm driving. It doesn't matter. My wife in the seven years we've been married has maybe driven me around a total of three and a half minutes in all the years that we've been married, because it's a control thing for me. And if I'm riding with somebody, it is driving me nuts because I don't have control of that steering wheel. I don't have control of that gas pedal. Most importantly, I don't have control of that brake. So I will wear out the passenger floorboard in your vehicle if you let me ride the whole time just pushing my foot down. By the time I get out, I'm having leg cramps because I push the, the, the brake pedal down so many times because I'm not in control and it, and it scares me and it drives me nuts. And are we not the same way? Are we not the same way when we feel like God is struggling, when we feel like something's gotten out of His hands or out of His control? Are we not the same way? Who knows better than me? It's time for me to regain control of my life. There are certain things that God just can't handle. There are certain things that He just can't gain control of. That's my job status. That's my shaky marriage. That's my rebellious kids. That's my addiction that I struggle with. There are certain things that God can't handle, so I've got to have control of it. And there's a telling indicator that lets us know when we've gotten to this point. So just in case you don't think that you're a control freak, but you really are, let me help you indicate there's always a severe absence of prayer. These people didn't pray. There's not a word of prayer. There's not a word of petition. They grumbled to Moses. Instead of pouting to Moses, they should have been praying to God. No prayer. They wanted to regain control. But there's two sides to this. And I know you've considered this thought, just like these people have, of would it not be better? I know you can relate to them in that, but there's more to it. There's another route. And this is where I feel like God has a call for us tonight. So I want us to work into this as well. So instead of it being better to turn back, would it not be better to push forward? Instead of turning back, I want you to consider this side of things. Would it not be better to push forward? Forward in Numbers chapter 13, so if we go backwards a little bit in verse 30, after the people were kind of getting upset over the report that the spies had given, Caleb says this, says, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able 
to overcome it. Now back in chapter 14 and verse 5, it says, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. Caleb and Joshua had gone through the land with the other spies that had gone. They had saw the same things. They knew there were giants. They knew there were fortified cities. But they also knew God's promise and that He did not bring them out of Egyptian bondage to let them pointlessly die in the wilderness. Yes, it was intimidating. Yes, the task seemed daunting. Yes, I'm sure Caleb and Joshua, if they admitted it, would have said it absolutely seems impossible. But knowing that God was with them, they knew it was better to push forward in faith than to turn back in fear. Egypt was garbage. They said this place was good. And as a people of God, listen to me, the path that He leads us down is very often difficult and challenging. It is a high calling to live as a follower of Jesus. And some of you are facing some of those challenges. Some of you, I have no doubt, are staring down some giants that are in front of you. There will be battles that have to be fought. The Israelite people didn't walk into the promised land and the giants just fell over dead. They fought. They drew their swords out. They did battle. There was bloodshed. There's going to be blood on the ground. But don't turn back. Push forward knowing that God is with you. He didn't put you on the path that you are on to leave you stranded and hopeless. If He did, He would be going back on His Word that says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Push forward. Men and women of God, push forward in your faith because what He has in front of you far exceeds what you left behind. Would it not be better instead of turning back to push forward? Now I want you to consider this as well. Instead of choosing comfort, would it not be better to possess promise? Look in verse 8. Joshua and Caleb said, If the Lord delights in us, He will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey. Caleb and Joshua they always stayed aware of what God had promised to do for them. And they attempted to remind the people that it was God who was going to bring them in and it was God who was going to give them the land. A land, by the way, that they described as flowing with milk and honey. A place that was far greater than anything these people had experienced previously in Egypt or the wilderness. In Numbers chapter 13, in verse 23, we get a description of what that land was like as Moses told the people to go in and spy it out. He says, I want you to check it out. I want you to see if there's cities. I want you to see who dwells there. I want you to see what kind of fruit of the land has to offer. And listen to what this says in verse 23. After the spies came back, it says, They came to the valley of Eshcol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them. So these guys had went into the land, and this is how bountiful it was. They found a grapevine, and they cut off one single cluster, and those grapes were so massive that two grown men had to use a pole and tie the grapes around it and carry it between the two of them. Y'all have seen the pictures of the Native Americans when they would kill a deer or something like that? What did they do? They run the, the pole between the deer's legs and tied it up. They put it on their shoulders and they carried it back to camp. We're not talking about a deer. We're talking about a cluster of grapes. That's how beautiful this land was. That signifies how great of a blessing that God was trying to bring into the lives of His people. We're all guilty of having our comforts, are we not? I get it. I've got plenty of comforts in my life that I don't want to relinquish. But when we surrender our lives to Jesus, there are new places He desires to bring us into. And it's much greater. And it's much more rewarding than any comfort we've ever known. And I'm not saying that Jesus is trying to give you a huge cluster of grapes. I'm not saying that He's going to give you financial blessing. I'm not saying following Jesus is going to lead to a brand new vehicle or a bigger house or a big old boat. I'm not saying any of those things are going to enter into your life as a, revolt, as a result of following Jesus. The promise that He's given us to possess is in John 14, 12, where He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in Me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will He do because I'm going to the Father. The promise that He has given us to inherit is to do greater things. 
The promise that we'll be His witnesses, that we'll reach people with the Gospel and see lives completely transformed and impact the world around us. That we'll see addictions broken and that we'll see strongholds torn down. And we'll see people come to know Jesus and be transformed by the power of His Word. Would it not be better to possess those promises and be a part of that blessing than to continue choosing what we feel like and know as comfort? One last thing to consider. Would it not be better? Instead of taking control, would it not be better to trust completely? Verse 9. Two faithful spies say, Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. As the people are getting ready to try and take control of a situation that they feel like has gotten out of God's control, out of God's hands. Joshua and Caleb try to encourage them to trust God with the conquest. And they say, this enemy is bread for us. And I always thought that was an interesting statement to describe someone as being bread for you. You know what you do with bread? You know what the Israelites did with bread? They consumed it. As they stand on the edge of promise and they see these giants in front of them, Caleb and Joshua by faith said, this enemy is bread for us. In other words, we will consume them because the Lord is with us. Their protection is removed. Our God goes before us. The danger for these people wasn't moving in but rebelling against. See, the beginning of verse 9 includes a warning. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Caleb and Joshua saw the dangerous thing that was about to ensue was the fact that God's people were going to rebel. And these moments where we think we need to take control are where we need to trust completely. So when that temptation creeps into your life to encounter a situation or a circumstance that you feel like you need to take control of, I promise you that's when you need to start trusting more than you ever have. Get back to trusting God completely with your career path. Get back to trusting God with your marriage. Get back to trusting God with your kids. Get back to trusting God with your strongholds and your shortcomings that you can't seem to overcome. But you need to see how this ends. So let's go back to Numbers chapter 14. And look in verse 20. It says, Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. So after the people groan and they complain and they rebel, Moses makes intercession for the people, begging and pleading God not to tear them down. And God relents from his anger. It says, But truly as I live, and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Now since the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valleys, turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by the way to the Red Sea. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumbled against me. And say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. And of all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones who you said would become a prey, I will bring in and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and shall suffer from your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, forty days a year for each day. You shall bear your iniquity forty years, and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this will I do to all this wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. To me, one of the worst parts of this story 
is the way God punished these people. And I'm not talking about the dying. God says specifically that everyone who is 20 years and older is going to pass away in this wilderness because of your faithlessness that I would bring you into the land. But to me, that's not the worst part. The worst part is the reality that they couldn't go back, but they also couldn't move forward. Stuck in the middle. Being stuck in the middle of anything to me is one of the worst forms of torture. It's knowing that you left where you were to go somewhere else you wanted to be, but not being able to get back to either one and not knowing how it's going to play out. Their faithlessness, listen to me, their faithlessness is heartbreaking. Delayed their children from experiencing God's blessings. I don't want to be responsible for holding a generation back because I thought my way of doing things was better. I don't want that on me. Parents, do you want that on your head? To carry around a faithlessness that delays a generation coming up from entering into the promises and the blessings of God. They went in eventually, but they were delayed from experiencing it. Would it not be better, husbands, to love your wife as Christ loved the church? Would it not be better, dads, to lead your family in fearing and loving the Lord and His Word? Would it not be better, wives, to honor God in your marriage by submitting yourself to Jesus? Would it not be better, moms, to exemplify righteousness to your kids? Would it not be better, students, to live for Jesus instead of popularity? Would it not be better, young adults, to climb after Christ than the corporate ladder? Would it not be better, senior adults, to serve the Lord than travel the globe? And if you don't know Jesus here tonight, would it not be better to have heaven than hell? Would it not be better to live as a servant than a slave? Would it not be better to be clothed in righteousness than rags? Would it not be better? Proverbs 14, 12 says, There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Let's not die in our ways when His are better. Hey, this is Trey Mitchell, college and young adult pastor. I just wanted to say thank you for listening. It's our prayer that God uses these messages in a way that challenge and encourage you to live for His glory. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus as your Savior, we would love to help you with making that decision. Just reach out to us through our webpage at underwoodbaptist.org. Be sure to check back in with us next week as we again encounter God through His Word here at Life.